All right, guys, welcome back to yet another episode of the Let's Assess podcast. I'm here with AJ today, and uh, we've been talking about um, kind of making a decision on a snowmobile, and now we're going to talk about uh, kind of for those of you who have a snowmobile uh, used or you've picked up your new one or going to pick up your new one here pretty soon, snow checks are coming in, Um, we're going to kind of be speaking to you now. So uh, we're going to go over pre-season checklist for snowmobiles what we do to get our snowmobiles ready uh new or used this year i'll be running probably a new one and a used one so we're gonna just kind of get into it look i don't want to talk how you try and press the kid and read you was soft all right guys welcome back so today like i just said we're talking about sled setup and uh me and age are going to take you through kind of our checklist so i'm gonna let him start and then we're just gonna really get her going here What's up, guys? Yeah, thanks for uh, tuning in on this one. We're going to just talk about that checklist. Um, first, we'll start off with the new sleds. Uh, this will just kind of be like a, a quick, fast breakdown of what we we do personally. So on a brand new sled, the first thing I do is when I get it home, I take all the plastic off of it, your hood, your side panels, all that. And what that does is that teaches you how to take it apart just in case you need to take it apart up on the mountain. And then I always make a mental note of like what tools I use to do that in the garage. And then I make sure I have those either in smaller tools or tools that I can use on the mountain if need to, if I need to do something. So be sure and be able to get all those plastics off. Um, And then once you have all that plastic off there, even if it's a brand new sled, I've had countless new sleds through my racing career. I had two a year. So every single sled, we always would like strip it down and then completely rebuild it even after like it just came from the factory because they don't tighten the bolts all. They don't um, lock tight all the bolts. So you don't need to go into that detail like we did on the race sleds. But even when I get a new sled, I like to just put a wrench on every single bolt, make sure they're all tight. And then you don't want to like really like really over tighten it but you can give it enough like tension to be like okay yeah that's tight you don't even need to spin it but you give it enough tension that you know it's tight and we're talking like all those bolts that um support the a-frame um your skid frame bolts all those is what you want to check especially anything that moves a lot like the in the skid frame um so checking the bolts if there's something that you know gets loose on them or you've ever had to tighten one before maybe throw a little blue loctite on that Um, that'll help keep those snug and you won't have that problem. Um, next thing is make sure you got your spare, spare belt and plugs an extra set of plugs. I mean, you wouldn't think with this fuel injection and these new sleds, you need to have a set of plugs. But last year I rode with a few guys that even fouled plugs on brand new uh, players boosts. And so, yeah, I've had that happen. The sled before this one fouled plugs a couple times because they're running rich when you get them. Yeah, they're yep. running through break in on their their computer. They're pumping more oil through it, so you're more likely to uh, foul plugs, and you don't want to be up on the mountain with no spare plugs. And the other thing is, at least with me, when I'm going in on uh, like break in rides and stuff like that, um, I'm not going full blast on it, or I try not to. Sometimes I do, um, but I let them idle. I let them warm up a lot before I'm pulling off the trailer, just stuff like that when they're brand new. Um, and you're likely to foul plugs. So that's a really good point. You need to have spare plugs with you. Yep. Yep. And that's, that's, he just hit the nail on the head. There's always extra oiling going on in that break in period. So be sure and, you know, be prepared for that. And when you're doing that break in, we'll kind of break down. I mean, my theory on a break in is I've took a brand new sled complete. I mean, you know, a brand's making new, not a single minute of runtime, really one or two heat cycles, just idling right to a racetrack. So, and even when we rebuild them the next week, it go straight to the racetrack. So I don't really believe in like easy break-ins. I believe in riding it how you plan, intend to ride it and breaking it in that way. And then you like, the biggest thing is when you're going down the trail, you don't want to just like hold it at like 5,000 or 6,000 RPM and just like a long yeah. time. Because what that does is, you don't get good heat cycles in your cylinders and then it doesn't like stretch everything like with that heat and let it expand the way it should be. So the biggest thing is don't do long periods of time at like a steady RPM. You got to move those RPMs all the time and let it kind of get through all those bugs, especially the first like 30 minutes to an hour is a very crucial time in a motor. Um, So 
that's kind of my theory on breaking. We'll kind of get back into the checklist, I guess. Um, when you're looking, when you're like tightening bolts and you're scoping everything out and looking at it, it's like good just to take like a mental note how everything is. Cause sometimes when stuff goes crazy inside there, you know, like you just need to know, I like to take pictures with my phone, just snap a couple pictures that way, you know, um, but as you're doing that, look under the motor, make sure there's no springs or bolts under the motor, kind of toss it around a little bit, make sure nothing's like loose in the engine bay. A lot of times in the factory, like they'll drop a spring and they will not get it. That spring will end up like under your um, drive belt or in your clutches and bang, bang your clutches up. So be sure and take a peek at that. Make sure there's no loose debris in there. Um, and then on that case, like be sure and look on if you have a drive belt sled. So uh, instead of having a chain case, an actual belt down there, look under it in the little there's like a little doohickey in the belly pan. Do, hey. <laughs> um, but in that little depression there, like stuff will fall into there and that's somewhere to check often because if you get like a spring or even ice in there, it'll wear a groove into your drive belt. And the next thing you know, you blow your drive belt. So always check that pretty frequently for, for stuff to get in there. Well, that's, that was the issue with the first year of the chaos boost or the Polaris boost. Like my brother sled, the some spring was breaking, and then it was getting into that drive belt. Yep. And when that happened, it blew the whole drive belt up. Yep. And like he had like six miles on it, we had to tow it back to the truck. Yeah, it happens often. So. Like, believe it or not, it happens more frequent than it it should, you know. But that is definitely something to keep an eye on. And I've seen people like they'll ride their sled to a cabin or something, and it'll like melt and get water in that little hole, and then it doesn't drain because there's not a hole in it and ice will get around your belt and then you start it up in the morning and you take off and it's like yes. there's a noise so you just kick it a few times and it'll quit but <laughs> you know make sure you get all that stuff out of there it'll save that belt life for sure um if you don't have a belt drive and you have a chain case like double check and make sure there's oil in it i've seen them forget to put oil in chain cases before so make sure there's oil in it don't trust the fact that the dealer looked or that you know, the factory did it. Make sure there's oil in it. Make sure it's got enough. And then make sure you have oil to replace that pretty soon. Like only put like 100 miles on it and then replace it. You don't want all that metal shavings from the new chain and gears like constantly in there. Um, so that's if you got a chain drive. There's not a lot of chain drive sleds on the market anymore, but there are a few still. In the player's world, there's not. But like that links is a chain case. Yeah, a lot of your your BRP, you do BRP links, yeah. all those are. So it's definitely something you need to need to keep an eye on for sure. Um, next thing is like your handlebar adjustments and controls and all that setup. I'll kind of let Brent jump on that. Yeah, so that's probably the biggest thing that I do. Um, I should do a lot of the things AJ says, but sometimes I'm just not mechanical and lazy. And I just, the number one thing that I do personally is I do like three heat cycles right when I get at home outside because it is rich, nasty exhaust. I don't want to fill the whole garage up. So I do that. And then, and, oh yeah. So then on the bar setup. So I think that is something that is super, super overlooked for a lot of people. They just take it off the showroom floor and they just adjust kind of themselves to the bars. Yep. You know, they just get comfortable with the throttle being in the wrong position and the brake being in the wrong position. Um, so I will take it. That is the number one thing I have to do before I ride it is I like my throttle pretty tipped up and high because I like my, I like to be over the bars somewhat not ridiculously I'm over the bars but I like to have that throttle tipped up and then the brake down so that way when I'm you know I rode dirt bikes my whole life so when my arms are like kind of cocked everything's comfortable and I'm not like having to reach down or whatever for the throttle most people when they get on my sled they say my throttle is just wonky yeah I'm one of those people for yeah. sure I got on a sled this year I'm like what in the world do you yeah. got going on here but but I'm like my setup is like brake straight forward where my fingers like just straight forward and then throttle like pretty level with the bar as well yeah because see then I feel like my wrists are like really cocked and I don't like that yeah but it doesn't in my opinion it doesn't matter how you have your handlebar set up as long as they're comfortable for you to ride correct if, if the thumb is like if you go to the extreme, say you just don't like using your thumb, you don't feel like you can get a good grip on that, then use a monster finger throttle. Go completely opposite. Um, 
but do what's comfortable for you. For me, the stock break lever is not that great. Uh, I just don't like it. So normally I put a skins break lever on it, um, but I kept having those break. So I, th no pun intended. Yeah, that's there's a stock one back on there. I went <coughs> through a couple and they were like, the heated ones were ridiculously overpriced. And I broke two of them. And so I just went back to the to the old stock lever. But get them comfortable. Get If you don't like your kill switch where it is, move it. If you keep hitting your kill switch, I see a lot of guys run it on the crossbar or, you know, going with an aftermarket kill switch that you have to hold down. I don't really move my kill switch. I'll tip it a little bit forward so I don't accidentally hit it when I go into the bars. But... I don't really do anything with my kill switch, but the throttle and brake are a big deal. The other thing is, if you don't feel comfortable with the height of your bars, change those out. That, like, from RSI or whatever, they have great bars, and you can get comfortable because everyone's so worried about turbos and all this stuff. It's like, if you're not even comfortable with your handlebar setup, why are you even looking past that? That's number one. Um, number two is I would look into the skis. So on these new sleds, and I think for the past 10 years probably, the skis are adjustable in the fact of making sure they're straight. And because, dude, I've gotten sleds where one's kicked and yep. the other one's straight. Well, that's which one thing. makes it wonky. That's one thing I definitely have on my list here too is like do your – so it's called ski alignment. Yeah. And you like take a long piece of metal and you run it along your track from all the way in the back – all the way past the front. So that holds it like straight to the track. And then you measure from each ski from carp, you do carbide to carbide, like carbide to the steel and then carbide to steel from the other side. And what that does is that aligns your carbide to your track. Cause even the skis, plastic shipping, or even riding like those will get wonky. The plastic will, but the carbide is what you're riding on. So make sure that you're adjusting like your track straightness to your carbide. Right. So I'll look at that, and then so it come, that's one of the adjustments, the alignment piece, and then the other piece is uh, how narrow or how wide you want the ski. So a lot of guys now, they like real narrow skis, which I don't – I normally like them in the middle. So like on Polaris, I think it's the same on BRP, you have three adjustments. You can put the spacers, one on each side, which is how they come from the factory, or you can put them – on one side or the other, and that adjusts how wide or how narrow the ski is. So if you're a technical tree rider, uh, you probably like it more narrow. If you want some more stability on the trail, if you're having problems with that, then you can widen them up, and it'll change the way the sled rides a little bit. So that's something else that I do. Um, other than that, I don't do a whole lot to a new sled. I do do heat cycles, and kind of contrary to AJ, or I guess I do agree with him. I don't really baby the sled, but I try to feather the throttle a little bit. And with me, normally, if everything goes right, I have the new sled before it's deep. Yeah. So I just go up there, like ride it, kill it, talk, you know, yep. BS, because you're just on the trail, and then start it up, go, let it heat up all the way. But other well, than that, on new sled, I, I handlebars for me, because I kind of like a wonky setup, that's what I'm comfortable with. That is the biggest thing for me. Yeah, and I feel like, you know, a lot of the time when you are breaking in a new sled, it's that early season. You're not really, like, hammering on it totally, like, super, super hard. But even if you are, like, that doesn't scare me one bit. Like, that's yeah. the way I would prefer to break one in, honestly. So it's half a dozen one to another. Everybody has their own theory, I feel like. But I don't think you – with the way the computer, like, controls them anymore, I don't think you can even abuse it, like, too much because yeah. it limits everything. Um Two things on the handlebar setup, too, is when you're, one, if you're putting risers on it and you're ape hangering it, just stop, <laughs> please. Like, don't do that. I don't care if you're six foot five, six foot seven. If your handlebars are, like, in an awkward position when you're, like, standing, like, if you're, like, if your elbows are at a 90 when you're standing, then when you, like, if it wheelies up or, like, if you're, like, or going uphill or anything like that, like they're going to be like at your neck then. So make sure you have them like your elbows pivoted down a little bit. Like you need to be more in an attack position, elbows up, you know, arms down and probably like a, oh, I would say 30% angle down, you know, you need to be able to stand up straight, but not, um, 
you know, not have your elbows at a 90, I feel like. Well, to put it in com- well in context, I used to run – dude, I was bad. I think I ran a three-inch riser because I was like, that's what's comfortable. <laughs> yeah, it's comfortable on the trail. Yeah, yeah. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Everyone – I mean, this would be way more comfortable than, like, being, you know, sprung out. But then I went to low – so I'm, like, six foot tall um, with boots on. I might – yeah, I'm probably, like, six or six one. Um I run low. Yeah. Low bars. So that kind of puts in the comparison if you depending on how tall you guys are. I feel like medium might be like a dude that's like six five, six four ish. I don't yeah. know. I've I've ran the mediums and they're a touch high for me yet. So that's I run the lows. And even like on the Arty Cats from the stock handlebar riser that came on, I would go an inch smaller than that yet. And I was I'm, doing I'm that on the one. links too. Yeah, and I'd the BRP that is notorious. For like sending way too long of a bar riser, I feel like, and you get a lot of torque on your steering column and all that with a huge. There's just riser. more leverage, yeah. Yeah, yep. So, well, that's information. That's good. <laughs> yep. That's but there again, if you you have to be comfortable. Yes. Just like think. A, so, yeah. Just think about being like when you're actually riding the sled when you're like not going down the trail. Make sure that's a priority for you, unless you're a Midwest guy that is pounding trails. Then make sure it's comfortable for the trail, but. Like, for the most part, like, if you're mountain riding, you need to make sure you're comfortable when you're really getting after it. Really getting after it. Well, Um, dude, you know what I do, too? I'll adjust them as close as I can in the garage, and then when I go up there for the first day that I'm actually going to be riding trees and doing re-entries and doing all the stuff, I'll bring those tools, which I have in my toolkit at all times, I bring those tools to um, make minor adjustments because – you think it's right until you're on a, you know, really steep hill and you're riding trees and then your body's going to be in different positions. So Absolutely. just keep it, you know, keep getting adjustments throughout the season, getting better and better. And comfort for me is, is a big deal. Yep. And having those tools with you as your style changes to adjust it as your style changes to is, is a key thing. Um, the last thing on handlebar setup, is when your post comes up out of your sled, so when you have all that plastic off and you're looking at it, when that post comes up, you want your handlebars to be in as straight of a line with that post as you possibly can be. You don't want them forward. You don't want them too far back. Like You want them in line with that post. So if that post is coming up at a 45-degree angle, you want those handlebars to be perfectly in line with that as close as possible. I mean, I'm going to give you a half inch of variance probably off of that post that you're probably all right with. But the more in line you are, the less kickback and feedback you're going to get when you're um, counter steering or laying it over on its side or hitting a tree or a log or uh, hard snow, you're hitting an old track, anything like that. That feedback you're going to get is a lot less. It's all leverage. If you have that torqued this way, then that gives those handlebars more leverage because it's it's further out there on the on the steering post. And so, I find that like the BRP side of things is really bad with that. Maybe my yeah. players has just been adjusted at the dealership, but like that links, dude, it wasn't even close. Like the steering post was, you know, coming like this. If you're on YouTube, you can see it's like this. And then the handlebars were completely yep. wonked. Well, and that's the problem with the BRP. Um, I shouldn't say problem, but that's the BRP steering post is at like a 45 degree angle running up. It was because still it comes, lost though. With yeah, that, yeah. Yep. But it comes from clear down by like the, the steering arms where Polaris and Articap both, they have a vertical steering post. So it is straight up and down underneath. And that's why your handlebars on a Polaris or an Articap, you turn like very straight this way. If you're watching on YouTube, if, um, if it's a BRP product, you turn like you push pull. That's the difference in the and different up down too. Yeah, and like, then it's like an up and a down motion. Yeah. So and a lot of guys like I know Turcotte puts a lay down steering post on his Polaris. Yep. Yeah. And and it's just it's preference. Like for me, I put a post forward kit on my Lynx because I like how that steers. I like a more vertical steering post. Yep. But comes from all different backgrounds to make yeah. it work. I came from the snowcross background of a lay down post and I can't stand it on the mountain. So it's just whatever you're comfortable with once again. There. And people will pick ski do versus Polaris just based off of a the way it post. steers. Yes. Yeah. Yep, absolutely. Which I get. It's a big deal. It's a big deal for sure. So let's go into or let's go into use. Yeah, yeah. So in the use sleds, 
Same thing every single year. If you're running a use sled, just like we are going to run, each of us will have a use sled this year. We're going to take all that plastic off. And what we're going to do differently this time is we're going to do it outside or at a car wash and we're going to clean everything. We are? No, yeah. I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> have a light degreaser with. There's belt dust, brake dust, everything in there, oil. We're going to get all that cleaned up just like it would be from the factory. That's your first thing you want to do at the beginning of the year. If you have the tools to pull your clutches off, do that before you wash and you can wash those separately. But if you don't have the tools to do so, you might take an air compressor and blow your clutches out the best you can. Everybody should be able to take the secondary off without, which is the, the back one that runs your drive shaft, not the one on your engine. Everybody should be able to take that one off before they wash it and take it apart and blow it out good. Or if you're not comfortable doing that, you can just blow it out the best you can with an air compressor. Same with your primary, blow your rollers out, blow every crevice out possible. Um, but if you can take them off, take them apart, get the springs out and like soap, hot soap water, like clean those clutches really good. Dude. Okay. <laughs> Let, I'm going to be very truthful right now. I am going to do that this year. Because it is yeah. important. It's very important, yeah. But you know what I normally do? I look in the side panel to see if there's a raccoon in there <laughs> or a rat. And if there's not, I just pour <laughs> gas in it and just want to let it go. Yeah. Yeah. yeah well, I and, don't do any of the maintenance stuff that I should. Yeah. And that's just it. Like, you can get away with a lot, to be honest. Like, you can get away with a lot. But to help yourself and save you some money, this is definitely the route you should go. Yeah. I am probably a bit too far on the maintenance side because I thoroughly enjoy just doing it. So that's, and I'm of, the exact opposite. Yeah. I'm like, it's eh, like yeah, I'll just I'll wait till I have a problem. One, probably. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 <laughs> uh, but so, yeah, so be sure and have like a light degree cert. Don't use like straight, super clean or purple power. Like you're going to etch the aluminum. Snowmobiles are all aluminum. You will etch it. So don't do that from experience. Um, <laughs> dilute it down, spray it down good. Even take a little brush and like try to clean up your clutch side, all that. Get all that grime out of there. Um, let it dry good. If you wanted to even like take your pipe and all that off, like just make sure you seal up everywhere and seal up your air box before you get too crazy with a pressure washer and watch for your screens and all that. Don't, don't get those too bad. Spray the insides of your plastic off good. Maybe scrub them. Um, <clears throat> just get it, get it back as clean as you can to start with. So once you're clean, then you got your clutches. If you're able to get them off and take them apart and hot and soapy water them, you'll probably see anything anyway. But if you've got them on your sled, just check them for cracks. Take a good uh, um, flashlight and uh, pick and just run it right around the shaft and just make sure there's no cracks that a pick would like catch in or you'll probably see most of them. Um, but look for cracks. Um, be sure and blow all that dust out of the rollers and those like moving pieces on the primary. That's where you'll get a lot of buildup of dust and it'll cause you a lot of problems and clutch failure, which no one wants. Um, so that's about all in the clutches. You want to, I guess not really, you want to inspect your belt tension while you're in that area. So make sure that it's not too loose or too tight where it's squealing or anything like that. If you don't have one of the later ones with automatic belt deflection. Yep. A lot of them have it, but there's a few that still don't. Um, so adjust that, make sure it's good. If you don't know how to do that, there's probably a lot of YouTube videos out there that show you how, or we're going to be doing a lot more of those tech videos here this year too. So follow the page for those and uh, we'll teach you along the way. Um, but get that belt tension, right? That's going to help keep your longevity of your belt better and keep it cooled down and working the way it should. But when you have that belt off, just take a look at it and make sure there's no like cracks in it and kind of like bend it backwards and make sure it doesn't break in half from like rotting through the summer or anything like that. It is rubber and does go bad and look for like glazed spots and what a glazed donut looks like when you look at it and it's got a shiny spot. That's what you, if you see a shiny mm -hmm. spot on your belt, um, oh, you probably burnt it when you were stuck or something like that or loading it on the trailer or something like that. Yeah, if, it you've happens. Had, if you've had a belt for a whole season, especially if you're running a turbo and you put quite a bit of miles on it, I would just replace it Yep. so you don't have an issue with it. Absolutely. If you have one of those glaze spots, you can take a scotch bright and scotch bright it out sometimes and get a little bit more life out of that belt. But what I like to do with those belts, like if it's got some burn marks on it and some like lines in it, like cuts in it, it looks like if it's got some use on it, 
I'll just make that my spare belt. Yep, and then exactly. that's a great spare belt to get you out if you need to. And then you can throw your new spare on or whatever. They'll get you a year by or whatever you need to that way. Yep. Um, so jump over to the other side of the sled. Once again, just like on the new sled, you want to check under your belly pan, like where you're in under your engine, by your clutches, under your drive chain case or your belt. If you have a drive belt, make sure there's no loose bolts or springs. Now, if you've got a use sled and there's a spring or a bolt there, then you're missing one somewhere, most likely. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. if you find something in there, you need to find where its home is. And while you're doing this, you know, obviously you're going to check all the bolts just like on a new sled because you've put a whole year on it. If one keeps getting loose on you, put that Loctite on there. And don't over tighten them. These sleds are all aluminum and you'll, you can just strip things right out. So just get them snug and tight. And then if you're just checking tight tension, just you don't have to even spin it. Just get it right there and make sure you just know it's snug enough. It's not going to go anywhere. But make sure none of that stuff's anywhere it shouldn't be towards them bouncing your clutches or your drive belt. And then make sure all bolts and springs are there. And then we'll kind of jump in just like the like on a new sled. You want to check your uh, ski um, alignment with the track. And then you want to check your track for rips or ripped lugs or dude, that's any, a big deal. Yeah, yeah, definitely. You don't want to be out there in a track. If you got like split. a three inch cut in your track, you might want to look at getting a different track or you know at least start investing some money towards getting a new track. Um, and while you're down there, like sometimes they'll start like delaminating and the there's cords that'll come out of them. If you have cords that are like getting like an inch long, two inches long, and they're gonna start getting cut in your caught in your idler wheels, take and just cut it with a razor blade and then take a lighter and singe them to where that makes them all flat again on uh, next to the rubber. That way it doesn't catch into an idler wheel. You'll screw up your idler wheel and you'll start ripping your track apart with, you know, with that ripping it out. So check for that. Just kind of give it all at once over while you're down there. You're going to want to look at your rear shocks and your front shocks. So as you're, and you're going to tighten all the bolts in your skid frame, cause those are the ones that get the loose the fastest, but Look at your shocks and make sure there's no oil dripping out of them. And if there is oil dripping out of them, you need to look at getting them rebuilt or you're going to need new shocks because they're going to blow on you like your first ride. Um, and then just take a uh, like a, a cloth or um, good paper towel and wipe the very bottom of the shock where the shaft goes into the shock. You just want to wipe that and get it clean because dust and debris and shit from the year before or summer will be going past that seal again. And it'll just help the seal life of your shock and keep them from blowing. I'll do that like two or three times a winter. Just kind of wipe around it, make sure that it keeps that shaft clean. And if you're pulling your sled on an open trailer or out in the environment a lot, it's something to do regularly because that'll help your, your shock life a lot, especially with like Fox shocks where it's a huge body sliding in and out of a big seal. It'll, it'll really help a lot there. Every, every time a piece of dirt gets in there and it cuts it, that's a chance of air or gas or oil leaking out. So check your shocks good, get them clean. Um, you want to check your track tension, make sure it's properly tight. I don't on know. On a new sled on too. New sled or you sled. After your first ride, you really should check it. Especially on a new sled, like it's going to stretch a lot to begin with. So the first few rides, you want to be sure and check how tight it is. Your manual or YouTube will tell you how tight it needs to be to your model that you're riding. But when you do that, you don't just be like, oh, yeah, that's tight. That's tight. You want to make sure it's aligned on your rails right, too. On the alpha, you don't have any alignment. But on the twin rail setups, you need to, like, make sure they're tight in the proper amount. I use my finger as the gauge and get it side to side. And what you do is you get it tight, you start it, and you spin that track. You hang the back and you spin it, and then you can check it side to side. If you spin it, that'll give you your alignment side to side. Oh, need to loosen this side a little bit to keep bring it that way, so on and so forth. Um, so that'll help you on both sleds, new and used. I kind of forgot this on the new one. Check your coolant level. Um, and then once you do a couple heat cycles or even at the beginning of the year with a used one, like check your coolant level a couple times. Just make sure you got enough coolant in there. It's weird that coolant disappears, but it seems to disappear at times. So just make sure you got a good coolant level. Um, on a used sled, check your spare belt and your spare plugs. Make they're in, sure they're in good shape. You might have put your spare plugs in and put your used plugs in and forgot about it or whatever just check them make sure you're in good shape there make sure your belt's good or you have a belt in a used one um 
if you have a chain case sled, BRP especially, or any model that is, change the fluid every year. You get moisture in there, things rust. There's they, a lot of metal shavings. Like just do it at least once a year, just for your, for me. Do it for me. Once. Do it for AJ. <laughs> yeah, please. I used <laughs> to change it every single race when I was racing. So please just do it once a year for me. <laughs> but, and the same goes for if it's a belt drive, make sure your, your tension is right. Um, and if you do your chain case and you take the whole cover off, make sure your tension's good and that your tensioner is working properly. And uh, that kind of brings me to the end of uh, the use section. Unless Brent has any more to throw in there. I don't. Uh, make sure you have oil and gas and make sure you're beeping ass. There you or go. hauling <laughs> beef. <laughs> there you go. But, yeah, that's, uh, I don't know. I, I've i never had, knock on wood, I've never had huge problems with new ones. Yeah. Brad has. And I know a lot of guys have because I'm part of a lot of Facebook groups. Well, and but, that's why, like, I know a lot of people are going to be like, the dealer's supposed to do that. But, like, don't trust your dealer, please. I mean... I don't want to knock on any dealerships, but the guys that put your sleds together are not the guys that have 20 years of experience, like mm. as a tech, like mm. they have the guy on the bottom of the total pool, putting the new stuff together because it's monotonous and it sucks putting new sleds together or even side by sides, four wheelers, whatever. So just do yourself the due diligence, check it out. Good. Make sure you're good. And then it familiarizes you with it and you're going to have a much better first day on the mountain, I feel like. Yeah, and a better season. Yeah, yeah. It sucked to blow your sled up on the first day because they forgot to put, put oil cool in it in or cool in it or something silly like that. So. Yep. Awesome. That's all I have. Cool. Well, well great. thanks for guys uh, listening, and uh, we'll catch you guys next week. Thanks, fellas. Later. Hopefully that helped you. Peace out. Bye. What?